Yeah, I know. I'm sitting here, so I know how you feel. I'm damned if I do, damned if I don't. Right now. <laughs> because you know, obviously, people out there watching this expect uh, me as a as a sneakerhead and representing for sneaker culture to ask a difficult question to the OGs out there um, that are watching this. How do the newer colorways that weren't out when uh, Mike was around, the lifestyle program and the such, really fit in with the Jordan brand? How does that make sense to what you're doing? Right. Um, so you know. The easy thing for us to always do is to bring back um, original colors. I mean, everybody loves those, and there's a history behind it. Um, but as you said, there's such a new generation. So, you know, we as we've grown eight times what we were, we didn't grow that big with just the same hardcore consumer because there's just not that many hardcore OG consumers. So we've adopted a new group, and so again, striking a balance that's going to keep this OG group real happy. And then doing some things for this new group that's going to make them happy, it's always a balance that I have to take and make. And so um, I think what we've been able to do is, or what we've tried to do is, you know, really kind of, I mean, we take pride in understanding who our consumer is. And so we know that the OG guys are going to love this stuff, but we also know that this new consumer that has adopted the brand has a little different swagger than the old guys, you know. And so that's okay, too. And so why not give these guys some things that... Um, that are fresh, a new point of view, um, kind of fits into what the world is about today. Um, as you know, the, this consumer has a tendency to change trends quite rapidly, whether it's through color, whether it's through material, through design, uh, contemporary versus old. And so that means a lot when you're building products. You know, you, materials and color selections all fit into kind of what's trend relevant. And so, um, Addressing those things with this new consumer is really kind of allows us to kind of grow the business, stay relevant with them, uh, but yet still strategically choose those times and places to drop the original colorways to keep everybody happy. Um, so, I mean, it, again, it's just a, about, all about balance. Sure. Now, for the OG collector that thinks that a uh, Retro 5 shouldn't come out in an army green colorway, yeah. why? Why should it? Um, well, we think that part of the growth of our business is um, really allowing ourselves to do certain things a little bit different. And, and you know, to your point earlier, it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. I mean, there's been times where we've learned the hard way. We've come out and we've dropped colors, and people don't remember this, but we've dropped colors in just Carolina blue, white, black, red, black, white, you know, black, red, basics. And then everybody comes out and says, why aren't you doing flipping colors, you know? So then when you start flipping colors, then people are like, well, those colors are too hot. So you're never going to win that battle. So um, we think, though, that um, when you're out, able to take a classic silhouette like the 5 and um, really funk it up with something that's totally different, we think that you're really touching on, two, in, on a business in two ways. You're, one, adding um, some new business to your portfolio because you're going away from what is traditionally done in sport performance type colors. And so now that's addressing this lifestyle that our consumer's all about. And, and, you know, I think one of the things that people might not realize that we think is that, you know, if, if a consumer is paying $135, $150 and takes pride in, in the footwear that he's buying, nine times out of ten, he's not going to go out there and take them straight to the court and just bang them up, you know. He's going to wait till they get old or a little bit shot or a little bit beat up or till he gets the next colorway before he eventually takes them out there. So we know that a lot of our stuff ends up being rocked casually. You know, we're not naive enough to say that, hey, look, everything we do just goes to the court. That's kind of silly. So doing something like an Army Green 5 allows us to play right into that world that allows us to address kind of a consumer need. And so that's kind of why we'll take a direction with our lifestyle business and maybe use uh, non-traditional materials or non-traditional colors to really help that consumer uh, really kind of, you know, address his, you know, his personal lifestyle needs as well as his on-court needs. And if he wants to go on-court with it, you know, we obviously have that as well. But this is kind of, you know, adds to his flavor when he's not on the court. So one of the other things that usually gets uh, maligned, I'd say, on, on the forums, uh, on Nike Talk specifically, shout out to Nike Talk for supporting <laughs> uh, is the concept of the fusions, right? The, starting from the Dub Zero uh, to the Spizax, the Nike Air Force One fusions now, the Six Rings is coming up as well. Um, tell us a little bit about how that fusion concept fits in with what you guys are doing. 
Okay, so, um, you know, there comes, there's two things. We have a strategy that we call our mixer strategy, which is basically things like the dub zero. And so we try to ground those things in uh, things that are relevant to the brand, to the legacy of the brand, or to Michael Jordan. So you'll take a shoe, um, you know, like the Spizike. Um, Spike obviously had a, had a, a part of our business in the past and created some great ads for us. So we take the six shoes that Spike was a part of, we blend them together, and we come up with something that hopefully is not just Mr. Potato Head, but right. actually looks like a shoe that someone will want to really rock and, and, and it started from an initial design. That's part of our mixer strategy. What we try to do that with that is it allows us to have some relief on, you know, continuing to have to bring out retros that everybody knows. You know, because the business side of it, as people, as retailers take the products that we introduce every year and they sell through them that are hot, the next thing they want to do next year is follow that up with something extremely hot. So the easy thing to do is say, hey, just give me that shoe again. Well, the more that I, if I were to continue to bring that same shoe back, the more that that shoe would lose kind of its special cachet. So projects like the Mixer allow us to kind of get after that in a little bit different way, um, but again, allow us to kind of play into the business side of it, but it, it also allows us to kind of create something that's new and hopefully fresh and cool for the consumer. And then you have projects like the Fusion. So the Fusion came about really because, um, you know, in this industry, there's not a lot, especially now when it's so retro-driven, there's not a lot of things that um, make a huge, huge impact. Um, and so, yeah, we can come out with different technologies and try to play those technologies into the shoes. And, and I think projects like the Air Jordan 23 was a huge step in the future direction of what, how you manufacture shoes, how you build products, how you have a you know, aesthetic point of view that's different and directional, no real retro flavor to it. If we could do more of that, I think that's only going to set us up for the future, you know, for the history of what athletic shoes can be in the future. Um, but there's not a lot of times where you can make a huge impact. And so what we said is let's try to make a really, really big impact. And if you took the best of both worlds for the consumer that we uh, target right now, what could you do? So you take the Air Force One who has a heritage and a following of its own, probably one of the single most biggest shoes in the game, and you combine it with you know, the athletic luxury and the specialness um, that's associated with an Air Jordan product, and you blend them together, you know, what, what could happen? What, could, what kind of impact could we make on this industry to really set a tone and a point of view that's pretty powerful? And so that's kind of how it came about. We said, you know what, let's just try it and, and see what happens. And again, that also allows us to have the, the, the time to um, give some of our retro products a break. I mean, there's, I mean, again, getting back to the damn, if you do damn, you know, there are people saying, hey, you guys are dropping too many retros out there. You know, and, and, you know, in a lot of ways, I believe, you know, we did. But again, because of the business side, we were forced to do some of those things. So when you take projects like this, you now have a, a chance to kind of give that some relief. So one might, excuse me, argue that, you know, as you get to re-releasing the Air Jordan 14, 15, 16, 17, they may not have that same cachet as the 3, 4, 5, and 6. And so um, if we could blend this, this project of like what we call the fusion of the Air Jordan and the Air Force One, we might be able to allow those ladder shoes in the Air Jordan portfolio to kind of build some uh, a loyal following or have that same cachet as some of the other ones. So that's kind of how it all played out. Um, and we think that, you know, it's kind of fun. It's kind of exciting. I think when you see the colors and, you know, how we plan on dropping them and releasing them, um, I think there's some pretty cool things that, that we're, we're going to do. Uh, it's fun sitting in focus groups and, and kind of shopping them with kids and getting a reaction to them. Uh, we got just some pretty sick reactions to some of the stuff that we've shown and so it almost has that that fever or that frenzy just like original retros do so um we're pretty we're, we're, we're pretty excited to see what